Good evening, everyone. Welcome to The Works. I'm Keith Williams, your host, on this uh, beautiful Sunday evening. And uh, this is October, so uh, fall is here in most of the country and um, starting to get cool in most parts of the country. And so I hope that you are enjoying your weekend. And our guest today is Jennifer Liberman. Welcome to the show, Jennifer. Hi, Keith. Thank you for having me. How are you? Uh, pretty good. Uh, it's been a busy weekend. Mm -hmm. Even a busier, uh, busier week. We got a lot of things to cover here uh, on um, on this network here, uh, the Oscillate Broadcast Section. Uh, we'll talk about that at the end. But right now, this hour belongs to you. Fantastic. <laughs> okay, so first of all, who is Jennifer Lieberman? Okay, uh, well, first of all, my name is Prince Lieberman. I know it's confusing, the spelling is weird. Um, so I guess in a nutshell, I'm an actress who writes and produces to give myself work, <laughs> basically in a nutshell. So I wear many different hats. Sometimes I'm just a performer. Sometimes I'm producing a project that I created for myself. So I'll be um, the writer, the producer, and the actor on the project. Sometimes people just hire me to be a producer. Um, and sometimes I'm just, the writer. So it just really depends on the project and the day. And um, my writing has um, spanned from poetry, spoken word, plays, short films, and now I have a couple of books. So that's exciting. Okay, so uh, tell us a little bit about uh, some of the projects that you have worked on. Sure. Um, so I'll start with my one woman show. That's kind of like the big tipping point for me career wise. That was when I basically decided that I was spending a lot of energy trying to get into the door and not enough energy actually doing the creative things that I desired to create. So um, I guess the phrase I've been using lately is I couldn't find a way in the door. So I decided to build my own house. And my one woman show was that kind of first venture into me learning how to build a house. <laughs> and I wrote a play. I played 10 different characters. I tailored it to showcase my versatility. Um, playing many different characters. The play had comedic parts, dramatic parts. Um, so I really got to play the whole range. And this show was a turning point in my life, um, in both my creative life and in my professional life, because it this one project kind of spun off and helped me venture down a path as an entrepreneur and also helped me continue down the path as a creative. So the one woman show, it was called Year of the Slut and it was like a feminist sex positive coming of age story, loosely based on my experience of being heartbroken in New York City, trying to find the one. And then as most artists do, we take liberties to make it more exciting and outrageous for the audience. So it was loosely based on my life, but then it took on a life of its own. So this play ended up winning an award in New York and I won the Audience Choice Award at the festival that it was at. So it gave me the confidence to build more of my own houses and basically create my own vehicles and I didn't want to do a one woman show again because it's kind of lonely and the fun is like getting to play with other creatives 
so but I did go on to that was like the beginning of me regularly almost once a year doing my own projects so that was awesome and then in terms I've mentioned it also spun me down a path of being an entrepreneur so I realized <laughs> that even though my play did quite nicely and I proved to myself that I was talented as an actor, I could do all of these things. I was so unprepared for having a career as a creative because for so long, like the eye on the prize was like getting a foot in the door and then it was creating a vehicle for myself. But these are all just one off, very short term goals that if you never take a chance to take a step back and look at the big picture, 20, 30 years could go by very quickly and you can end up somewhere that you don't necessarily want because you didn't plan for a gig to gig kind of lifestyle and how you can hit the certain milestones in life that your friends are hitting that are in a more stable career. So you try to have an acting career, let's say in Hollywood or something, and it was not successful. So yes. So at first it was not. And so when I did the show, like I said, even though the show won an award and it did well, you know, and it got me some recognition, I had been in the game for about 10 years at this point. And I realized I needed to look at a bigger picture. So I went back and I started taking some business classes and I learned how to treat my creative career like a business and how to set up goals and milestones as one would if they had started a business. If you, you know, any type of business you start, you want to, you have a trajectory, you want to hit a certain number of clients or a certain number in sales. And then those numbers need to keep increasing or at minimum maintain a, a bottom line in order to stay afloat. So these are things that a lot of creatives, unless you go to a business school or you have parents who kind of map out, sit you down and explain this to you and map it out, it's a lot of flying by the seat of your pants. And even if you get lucky and have a big break and land a TV show, there have been so many celebrities that have landed a show and they had a great run for three years or five years, and then you never really see them again. And you, you know what I mean? So even people who hit their stride and have that success, it's a real, I think it's kind of an issue with young professionals that, you know, that a lot, a lot of people, don't, we don't have this discussion. Nobody sits us down and it's like, okay, you know, even if you have a good run and you can put some money aside, you know, there's a, there's a lot more to life that you're going to want to be able to to do that you have to plan for. Um, I think our Tre Trevor Noah would probably be a good example here. He was on The Daily Show for like seven years and now he's calling it quits. Uh, he's a, a comedian, a stand-up comedian by profession. Mm -hmm. And he was like so used to like, traveling to different places, doing comedy shows. Um, I think he said that he wanted to go back to, you know, go back to doing that. And yeah. so with that, that would end his, you know, seven year run on The Daily Show. I think that would be a perfect example. But for you otherwise, uh, we, we don't see, I, I, I have not seen, you know, any type of production, whether it's a play, a movie, a, a TV show, an anthology, or anything where you will have uh, this one person, you know, being part of the show. Uh, so, not, 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 since the, not since the 70s. So, yeah, so actually a, a one person show is very lofty and a lot of actors do them, but there's 
only a few actors that are actually known for them. John Leguizamo is one of them. He's, in my opinion, the king of the one man show. He's done several. Um, I think his first one was called Freak. And the most recent one he did was called Class Clown. And um, his have gone on to become like HBO specials. But one of the most famous one person shows is My Big Fat Greek Wedding. And basically the woman who created that piece, she wrote it as a movie and she couldn't get it into the right hands and nobody, she couldn't get it. She couldn't get in to the door. She couldn't get a foot in the door. So basically she decided to do it as a one woman show and play all the characters, play her family members. And by some stroke of luck, Tom Hanks's wife, Rita Wilson is Greek and got wind of the show in LA and went to see it and ended up championing the piece and helping it become the big, huge franchise that it is now with its third um, sequel coming out. Is it really difficult to do uh, a one person show or a one person having to do multiple characters? So it it is very daunting, um, but I think for the type of people who are drawn to that type of show, it's just in our nature. Like, yes, I definitely worked hard on it. Like there were a lot of lines to memorize because I was on stage for an hour and a half by myself. And people think like, oh, well, it's your story. You wrote it. Can't you paraphrase? Well, not if you want the quality of writing to remain elevated not if you want the jokes to hit as you know like one two punch clearly as they were written um and not just that like the people don't realize that you need physical stamina and vocal stamina so when I was in rehearsals for my one woman show I was training physically simultaneously so I was like I went a little cuckoo but I would go, I would do a cardio class at the gym. Then I would do a yoga, like a, a yoga class after the cardio. And then the, the gym I was at, I was fortunate, had a pool. And I would literally swim laps back and forth while reciting the lines of the play. And I wouldn't count how many laps I did. I would basically just begin with the first line. And I would swim back and forth, lap after lap, until I spoke out loud the entire play while I was swimming. Because you need energy to be running around the stage and jumping and playing one character and snapping into the next character. You can't be tired. <laughs> you know, you got to make it look easy. You got to make it look fun or else the audience is going to fall asleep. <laughs> They're going to get bored. Uh, so, so um, filming that type of production is quite difficult, especially if you're the writer and the director as well as the actor. Well, I did have a director. I didn't tr try to direct myself, but yeah, it was. Okay. It was challenging, but I don't know about you. I love a challenge and kind of the greater challenge I take on, the more satisfied I am at the end when I achieve it. Um, so that, that kind of reminds me, you know, I know like, you know, in certain movies you have, you do have multiple characters, but so there's this one particular, uh, there's this one particular character that would pay, play like, you know, different characters. Uh, the person I'm talking about is Eddie Murphy. Yes, I was. So he's a, I, so he's a perfect example. Insane. Right. So he's a perfect example of someone that's playing like multiple characters, you know, even though there are, you know, there are other characters that are played by different actors. Yes. And so those characters was probably that Eddie Murphy have done was the center, you know, center of the show. And, um, and a lot of it was physical comedy. So he had to, you know, he definitely had to be in shape uh, physically 
and emotionally in order to play those uh, multiple parts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they all sound different. They move different. You know, Eddie Murphy, like he puts on prosthetics and he, you know, puts different makeup on for each character. But even before they figure out what characters are going to look like, I'm sure he has an idea of how they sound and how they move. And he has like a collaboration with wardrobe and with makeup, you know, in order to help build the final look of the character. Um, because all of those, all of those factors come into play. But yeah, I, I love Eddie Murphy. He's phenomenal. Like even in the OG coming to America, he played multiple roles. And um, I've had the privilege of being a waitress at one of his parties. <laughs> when I lived in LA and um it was a highlight I have to tell you because he's phenomenal <laughs> so is is it is it easier uh you know is it easier to play multiple characters you know in a movie versus doing a play you know it's a really good question um I don't know because I've never played multiple characters in the same project on screen. I've only done that on stage. So I've done two different one woman shows, one play with 10 characters, the other play was seven characters. And then the last play that I did before the pandemic, I doubled as both Judy Belushi, John Belushi's wife, and Gilda Radner. Um, and in the first half of the play, I was Judy Belushi, and then she didn't come back in the second half until the last scene. So the whole second half, I was Gilda Radner. So I had to wear a wig, um, you know, because Gilda's hair is different than, and Gilda has iconic, big, curly, dark hair. Um, you know, I, it's very different. I, I'd have to say doing it on stage because the audience isn't close up, they're they're a little more forgiving um, as opposed to ha having to do the role on camera. The nuance has to be really subtle. Um, so I, I would think that would be more challenging. Um, it was... Um... You know, and you know, in my brain, I think uh, that playing multiple characters on stage would be a little bit more difficult than playing multiple characters in a movie because, you know, you know, in a movie, you know, they often film and tape, and then they go in post production and then put everything together mm -hmm. uh, so that you establish uh, continuity. But in a play, you can't do that because, especially if you like live, you know. Yeah. There, there is no post production. Yep. So or anything like that. So because I'm used to doing live stage, um, I I'm not as nervous about about it and train myself and rehearse in a way that I, I can deliver it on one take and I can snap into the right character at the right moment and the right accent and the right intonation. Um, that's a lot of work. Like it's a lot of um, practice and a lot of training, but I don't know, for some reason, I think because there's that distance between me and the audience, I don't have to, of course you always aim to be spot on. Nobody aims to be less than perfect, but if you are less than perfect on stage, I'm not right here, you know, like on film, I'm right here. I'm like right up close. So if I make, you know, a tiny little mistake, people can pause it and rewind it and compare it. And you know what I mean? So to me, that's like a little scarier. <laughs> like I, I, stage, I it's like in how, a flash and gone. <laughs> I, I, I don't see how you, I don't see how you do it. I mean, um, when, when I was in college, I, um, I done theater theater when I was in college and I did several plays, you know, when I was in college and I never had to deal with any of the, some of the stuff that 
you know, that you have done because, you know, you have multiple characters uh, in these plays, but it's played by a different person. You didn't have one person doing multiple characters. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, how do you do it? You, like I said, it's just a lot of, like, you just keep practicing. But I guess, I guess the way I compare it to is like, you know, do you play any sports or do you play any video games or board, game nights? Like, is there anything you do on a competitive level, like in your own life, Keith? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I, 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 I play video games, uh, don't do much sports. Okay, but if you're gaming yeah, with your friends, isn't it more fun to game with friends that are like on your level or like a little better than you than friends that that need to play like e easier levels? Um, I would say it's, it's more competitive with other people. Yeah, you know, so, so that's, I, I kind of feel like, you know, like I compare it to like playing tennis or playing baseball. It's like when you're a good player, you want to play with other good players because it's more fun to kind of go hard. And that's how I feel with like my, like with acting, it's like you get to a certain level, you take on really difficult roles and really difficult challenges. And then that's what gets you fired up. And then you want all the roles to be challenging and you want to be able to like flex those muscles at that kind of expert level, as opposed to, you know, kind of showing up on a sitcom and being the waitress and asking the lead character, you know, if they want their martini dry. Well, it's kind of like, you know, you leveling up. Mm -hmm. You get to the point and then you say, you know, um, you know, I want to play with someone that uh, is a little more experienced than I am. So it's kind of like that. Yeah. Or doing the hard tricks, you know, because it was a solo show. You're not working with other actors, but say I'm doing, you know, I'm skateboarding. Like I want to go on the rails. I want to do the flips. I want to do all of that, but, you know, because as you get better, it's more fun to do the the harder, more riskier stuff. And for sure, I do agree with you. It's risky because there's a greater risk of messing up. <laughs> you that have a much greater chance. Me. That kind of reminds me, like, uh, there was one particular season of uh, America's Got Talent and this great comedian, I think his, uh, his name is Greg Morris, and he does, like, uh, a lot of, you know, impressions. Mm-hmm. He does a lot of impressions, so he does a like, I mean, he can do like a hundred plus, you know, characters like back to back to back to back without yeah. stopping. You, you know, that's what they're in. Each time that he went to, you know, a, a deeper level in the competition, um, it became like a bigger challenge and he stood up to that, you know, that bigger challenge. Exactly. Is that, is that exactly. is that like a good example? I think that's a great example because it's like as we get better at things, you know, like children, like children are very quick to be like, oh, that's babyish. I don't do that anymore. You know, I don't play with that toy or I don't watch that show. Right. Because they don't want to be associated with being a baby or being an amateur or being, you know, like less than. So I definitely think actors love rising to the occasion. You know, like one of one of the best roles I ever did. I it was an off-Broadway show I did in my early 20s. And I was cast as a mentally challenged girl who got raped and murdered. And it was like a horrific play. It was tr like heart wrenching, you know, but the actor in me is like, oh my God, like I have to play a mentally challenged person. Like that's like the, a huge, huge, huge challenge. Like, you know, to, to not make it into a caricature, you know, to have like a grounded, nuanced, authentic character. And then layering on top of that, like having to have a rape, rape scene as the mentally challenged person. And I know this sounds like a really 
you know, like terrible conversation, but for, like from the actor's point of view, this is what we call a really meaty role. Something where, you know, we, we have to like use all of our skills that we've accumulated over all the years of going to class and watching different movies and studying different actors. It's like, you know, and you have to create this like really, you know, heart wrenching, upsetting stew you know and like I said like it's it's a horrific you know thing to have to conjure but as an actor way more interesting you know than being waitress number five <laughs> so what, what what are some of the uh so what does the audience look like so what is the audience uh makeup of uh, of one of your shows so, so my stuff, um, people, I get, I've got really good feedback. People tend to enjoy my stuff. Um, I really flip-flop between drama and comedy. I love doing humor. I love comedy. Um, so my one woman show was a comedy. It's now a number one best-selling novel called Year of the What, and it's won five literary awards. Um, it's been recognized as one of the best rom-coms of 2021 um which was really great so I you know and but I also like but I flip-flop so this one is like really comedic and kind of out there and then the new piece that I'm working on my film that I'm raising money for is like super super heavy dramatic heartbreaking and um I've gotten really really good feedback on it from people in the industry, but I've also, with as much enthusiasm as I get about how good the writing is, I get the equal amount of enthusiasm that they can't raise money for a movie like this because they don't know how to sell it. So, <laughs> so um, you know, well, like, like a, let's kind so, of like a, a independent film. Exactly. But so basically not everybody's going to love everything you do. I guess that's what I'm getting at. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, too, uh, have you met, uh, you know, any individuals who, who, you know, are acting or aspire to be actors, but they cannot get a break in in Hollywood or anything? Well, like that? most of us. Yeah. Like so many of us. And that's why there's so many small short films and independent films and little theater productions, because in the meantime, we still have to maintain our talent. You know, you can't go to acting class or get a degree in theater in college and not get work for 10 years and expect that you can still just show up and do it on a dime. So we all need to stay in practice and stay in shape. So I continue, um, I just shot my latest short film in LA last month. I haven't performed on stage since 2019. The pandemic kind of took me out of the game for that, but I'm hoping to do a play in the next year or two. We'll see what happens. Um, but so yes, there's so many people and, you know, a lot of people have side hustles and they're still auditioning or people will take a lucrative full-time job knowing that they can do one or two of their, put put their money aside and do one or two short films a year or, you know, do their solo show. So there, there's still a lot of people who need to maintain a creative outlet, even though the bulk of their income isn't coming through performance. Like the bulk of income for the past few years since I was doing off Broadway has not come through performance, partially is because the pandemic and partially is because I've pivoted and I've been focusing on promoting my novel the past year uh, since it hit number one on Amazon and has been in, been winning awards. I've had this past month alone in September, I had four book events. So um, I, I flip flop from wearing different hats at different times. Um, but I also, I have a company, it's called Make Your Own Break, and this was like the entrepreneurial path that the one-woman show spun me into, 
So on the, on the one hand, I still create my own projects and it's very fulfilling creatively. And then on the other hand, I started a consulting business where I help struggling actors and writers figure out how to create vehicles for themselves. And um, I, I help them figure out how to do it with little to no resources. So basically using the resources that they have and the people yeah, that are around good. them. This is that was going to be the, the next part of the segment. Talk a little bit about your book and your business. But before we get into those two things, um, I also want to point out that you had some actors that have taken to social media uh, for their content, like on YouTube, uh, mm -hmm. particularly there's an African American uh, uh, male, uh, it's probably maybe in his 30s or something you know, have been doing a lot of comedy skits and post them on YouTube. And it's like very popular. He has all of these, you know, different type of characters and different situations. It's like really funny. Uh, so there's yeah. several, so there's several individuals that have taken that route and mm -hmm. uh, they have a big following on, on YouTube. I seen that now locally, you know, where I'm at, there's a, a a good friend of mine uh, had produced uh, had produced a series um, uh, that's being um, it's it's not showing on social media. I can't I can't think of the outlet that you know that he's Hulu or Peacock or uh... Probably, uh, probably. And then there's another. And then there's another guy that I know um, that. Um, he, um, you know, have his own uh, streaming service. Uh, mm -hmm. It's called Culture TV, and it's something similar to Hulu and Netflix. Uh, but they charge a little bit less mm -hmm. you know, than the two. Uh, than the two, but they have uh, exclusive. They have exclusive content. You mm -hmm. know, um, probably about eighty. To ninety percent of it, it's like original. Amazing. Um, yes, yeah, it's you know original. So, those those are some avenues that you know people who you know who want to act that can't get into uh, mainstream Hollywood. Hollywood, that's what they do. So, I just want to point that out. Yes, and ex and especially today, where most of our phones are a camera that come equipped with editing software, it makes it so much more accessible. Right, and then you got a lot of people uh, are going into podcasting. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of like me, I've been in the business since 2007. So, um, and you know, we do a lot of, you know, interview type stuff and, um, we we also have do informative pieces, mm -hmm. you know, as well. Uh, like for example, um, I did a couple of pieces on um, recently uh, with uh, famous African American authors and influencers, Amazing. you know, that I done that I done recently. So, mm -hmm. so we do more than just interview type stuff, and also too. Um, you know, we do kind of like, uh, I wouldn't say breaking news, but we cover like major, um, we cover like, you know, some major uh, news story. Like for example, um, October 3rd to the 5th, um, I would be covering uh, a Supreme Court case mm. in Washington, D.C. Wow. Which case so, I mean, it's, it's not it's not per se acting, you know, uh, it's not per se acting, you know, when you're podcasting, but sometimes in, in podcasting, uh, podcasters kind of like bring their own spin and their own personality, you know, into their podcasting. I, I get a lot of uh, compliments, you know, from that, from interviewers. Uh, they really like my style and flow of podcasting you know like i'm actually bringing in my own personality 
mm-hmm. you know, anything podcast instead of being monoton- monotonous. Have you seen that show? Uh, it was a show back in the 80s called Daria that used to be on MTV. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> and the lead character, oh man, you know, her voice is like, I, yes. can't, believe I can't believe this is happening. You yeah, know, I, I, I agree with you. Podcasters, YouTubers, it's all performative, right? And anything that's performative, you there's a personality that comes to it, whether it's your on-camera or on-air persona, or whether you bring, you know, your everyday, this is me personality. Um, that definitely is what makes or breaks a podcast for sure. I think people want to watch people that they can relate to, people that cover subject matter that's interesting to them, like-minded people. And and part of that has to do with like a sense of humor. You know, we all have like unique sense of humors, unique personalities, but that's also what attracts people to tune into you. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I, I remember having this uh, particular person uh, I did an interview for on a podcast and the guy looks exactly like my dad. Oh, cool. Yeah, I mean, he looked exactly, you know, like my dad. And mm-hmm. I did, I tried so hard, you know, not to go there. I tried so hard not to go there with him on camera. Mm -hmm. I figured that, you know, if I do that, I'm breaking character. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And it was like really hard. And, you know, when the podcast was over, I was like, oh my goodness, I'm so glad that was over. He said, why? Because you look like my dad. That's so funny. You know, and I tried to hold that in for a whole hour. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was, it was hard, but you know, you know, I, you know, I did it and it was like, I was just like, wow. So yeah, you are right. It is this kind of, uh, you know, persona, you know, that you bring, you know, uh, you know, whether you are on YouTube or you're podcasting or, you know, or what you do, you, uh, um, you do short films, you do plays. So um, it's, it's all about uh, a persona. Uh, but I think with podcasting, everything, you know, you like really being yourself and you bring your personality into it. I guess it depends on what podcast it is. Like if it's something, you know, pertaining to news, you know, of course you have to maintain that level of professionalism. Mm-hmm. So we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit about your novel, your book. Great. (laughs) All right. So uh, take it away. So like I've been talking about my one woman show, Year of the Slut, won an award in New York, and I was encouraged to adapt it into a novel. So I did. Um, I very much have had a personality in the past that I I was always open to suggestions. Like if people had suggestions, like, because of course we all know entertainment is a difficult business to get into. It's hard to break in. It's hard to get a break. Otherwise everybody would be a huge superstar. So on my travels, there have been several things um, along the way that people have presented to me. And I just said, okay, I'll do it. Um, and the first of those things was doing a one woman show. I never thought I would do a one woman show. I had produced one woman shows for friends and colleagues before. Um, I didn't think, I thought I was a good actor. Like I knew, I knew when, since I was young, like I wanted to be a performer. I had this burning desire, like, you know, I couldn't be deterred from pursuing this career path. But I never, ever, ever thought that I was the type of actor capable of playing 10 characters, playing multiple roles, snapping in and out of them, being on stage by myself for an hour and a half. 
you know, it's funny because you asked me, like, is it difficult? And now that I've done it and I've done it several times, I'm like, ah, no, it's not difficult. It's what you do. It's what I do. I'm an actor. Well, fast, you know, rewind a few years before I had ever done it. And I was like, no, 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 I am not that good. Like I, that is something outside of my wheelhouse. And I had been spinning my wheels in LA and nothing was really happening. And I was super frustrated and I met a woman and she said to me, she's like, write yourself a vehicle. You're a good writer. You're a good actor. Write yourself something. Write yourself a one woman show because then you don't have to worry about hiring other actors. Um, it's like very contained. It's literally one person show. You just kind of need yourself to execute it. Um, I did, like I said, hire a director and I hired a lighting person to make sure that there were lights and music cues that would come up, up and down throughout the show. But um, so I did, I did the show and I realized I had more skills than I thought, which awesome. That's always awesome, right? When you find that out, you're like, oh, I'm better than I gave myself credit for. So that was fun. And then, yeah. It's, Somebody said this would be a great chiclet novel. The title Year of the Slut is fantastic and it'll fly off the shelf. You should write the book. So I ventured <laughs> onto this many year journey because I gave up several times and didn't think it was good enough and didn't think I was good enough um, and got discouraged and got negative feedback and let that affect me. Um, and then you know, a year or two would go by and a friend would kind of be like, whatever happened to that book? Like, are you still right? Like, did that ever happen? And eventually, um, I, I gave up, I think I gave up three times. And finally, the fourth time I, um, I finished it. And a friend of mine convinced me to under the goal of just finishing it. Like, don't worry about being successful. Like, cause that's too daunting. Like, don't, don't even try to sell it. <laughs> cause who can even think of selling a book? Don't even do that. Just finish it and put it on Amazon. And then it's like done. As opposed to like all the screenplays that I've written that I need like millions of dollars in order to make them into movies. You know, he was like, this one, this is easy. Just finish it and put it on Amazon and you're an author. It's, it's a book. <laughs> so I was like, oh, well that that doesn't sound so hard so I did I hired editors and proofreaders and had someone help me with the artwork and and I put the book online and and I was done or at least I thought I was done <laughs> and then I um I had a friend help me with some marketing stuff and we tried to do some Facebook ads and Facebook does not like the word slut <laughs> <laughs> turns out either does Amazon or Instagram or any of the social media outlets that you can advertise your book on, <laughs> including Amazon, which is where it's like exclusively available. So I was like, this is kind of a problem. <laughs> so um, I was really frustrated because everybody who convinced me to write the book convinced me to write the book because the title would fly off of the shelves. Like, you know, I didn't even have to do anything. People would just hear the title and like the books would just like have wings and fly. So um, that didn't happen. So then I had to grapple with the decision of, do I let this thing just kind of die where it is without giving it a chance or do I try and get it into the world so I decided to pull myself up on the bootstraps again and give it another good old college try so I decided to change the title and I changed the cover of the book and I was able to rebrand and get it out into the world and it became a number one bestseller on Amazon and it's currently won five literary awards including the gold medal at the Global Book Awards for coming of age books and the bronze independent publishing award for romance and erotica books good for you congratulations you you stuck it you stuck it through you stuck it out 
you overcome the naysayers and the critics and the whole nine yards. I, I beat the algorithm. I beat the algorithm. <laughs> Um, I, I have to ask this, uh, what are some of, do you have like any body that you are accountable to any people that like encouraging you or what's been anybody that has been an inspiration to do what you do? Well, so many people, like I'm, I'm so blessed, but I've had some really amazing influencers in my life. I have to, like, I'd say like the, the first two are definitely both my grandfathers because both my grandfathers are immigrants and came to Canada with nothing. And knowing their struggles and their story of what they did, like to do whatever it took, you know, working during the day, going to night school at night to learn the language, taking an extra job on the weekend, um, literally do it, you know, like I, one of my grandfathers, I remember he said he never had a hot shower in his life or, or more than one meal a day until he joined the army for World War II. And, you know, so I think having a connection to my relatives who really struggled and who really instilled the the incredible opportunities that being in a country like Canada gave us and gave our family, um, that's major. And, you know, I kind of have said before, like, I'm lucky that, that, that I'm first generation Canadian because my mom is also an immigrant. My, my mother's side is from Tunisia, Tunis, North Africa, and my dad's side is from Poland. Um, but having that connection and knowing where my family came from and knowing how hard they struggled and, and what it took to get them here. Like, I really have a huge respect for not just their sacrifice, but respect for where I live. Um, and I know the world isn't a perfect place, but it's way more perfect than it was 10 years ago or 50 years ago or a hundred years ago. And we, we do have to acknowledge that. Um, you know, so that's number one, and that's huge for me. And number two is my best friend who I was supposed to move to LA with and become a filmmaker with died very young. And he never had the chance to pursue his dreams. He didn't even finish college. And his memory keeps that fire um, burning inside of me of staying inspired and staying true to myself um because I'm here and I have the opportunity and he never had that opportunity and if he did he wouldn't squander it so I can't either oh wow uh that is a very moving story Thanks. and we're going to get ready to close uh but I wanted to ask you uh what advice do you have for someone that wants to go into acting you know but are frustrated because they can't get a break um, in traditional in a traditional setting yeah so i would say find a community i've found a lot of my acting community and my collaborators in acting classes because where do actors go where do directors go where do writers go we have to be part of a community. It's one of the most collaborative, you know, industries in the world, the amount of people it takes to do a show or a film. So definitely find a community and work with them and grow with them. Um, just like an anecdote, but one of my closest friends in the world, I auditioned for his student film. 15 years ago when he was going to film school and I got cast in the role and that was the first project we worked on together. We've worked on several projects to date. I've produced several of his projects. He was recently nominated for an Emmy and he produced and directed my last short film. 
And, you know, I think a lot of people when we're starting out, once again, like we have our eye on the prize and we don't have our eye on the process. And something like having your eye on the prize would be like, oh, I want to work with Judd Apatow or I want to work with, um, you know, like who the biggest director is today, like a Spielberg or somebody like that. But having your eye on the process is being like, okay, who's going to be the Spielberg in 15, 20 years? I need to know those people. And those are the people that you get to learn and grow with. And then as you get opportunities, you can bring them along. And as they get opportunities, they can bring you along. So I would say, be in it for the process, not the prize. And uh, how, how would someone be able to reach you if they wanted to get in contact with you? Sure. So my website is makeyourownbreak.com. And that leads to my book and my acting stuff and all my other info. And all social media is the same, the at sign. And then I am Jen Lieberman. So at sign, I-A-M-J-E-N-L-I-E-B-E-R-M-A-N. Well, it was certainly a pleasure meeting you. This is such an inspirational story. Oh, thank you. Uh, where, you know, someone has a dream and it kind of like, not derailed, but detoured. And instead of saying, you know, I'm going to give up on my dream. And instead of saying, well, you know, I'm not, since I can't be at the table, you know, I'm not going to do anything. You created your own table. Exactly. And trust me, I'm happy. I want to be invited. I want to be invited to the table too. But in the meantime, I've got another one over here and I can invite some people to mine. <laughs> right. So are, are there any future projects that you're planning on doing? Yes. So as I said, I have a feature film. So I've gotten great feedback on the writing, but it's quite dramatic. So it's an indie kind of film. And I almost have enough money raised. So we are in the very early production stages for that project. So that's super exciting. I am also writing the sequel, part two to Year of the What. And um, that one's going to be coming out in about a year. All righty. Well, I, I cannot tell you how proud I am for, first of all, for not giving up. Thank you. Oh, you that's know, the key. That's the key. Just don't give up. You'll end up somewhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah, you, just, you created your own table. You know, since I can't be at the table, I'm just going to create my, you know, my own. And um, again, it's such an inspiration for you to be on here. I, I hope that that will give somebody some, some courage mm -hmm. and encouragement to pursue their dreams. I really uh, hope so. I really hope so. Because if I can make it happen, anybody can make it happen. Like everybody has gold inside of them. You know, you just have to do some digging to find it. And you have to stay persistent. But I'm no more special than the next person. So if I was able to make it just by sheer sticking with it, and you know, kind of putting in the hours every day, anyone can do it. Thank you so much uh, for being on today and sharing your story. Thank you, Keith. Well, you have and a great night. Definitely going to have more stories, you know, like this. So, you know, stay tuned, folks. You know, we, you know, we like to give information, but we also like to share stories and we like to bring people on that uh, empower and encouraging people. Uh, so once again, thank you so much. And that will end this segment of the works. I hope that uh, that you were inspired and you got uh, a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of encouragement and a little bit of empowerment. Um, if you got a dream, everybody's not going to, you know, be supportive of your dream. So the person that has to be supportive of your dream is yourself.
And once that happens, you know, then people, nine times out of 10, people are going to, you know, support you, but don't expect everyone to support you. The, the very person that you have to support is yourself. Exactly. And if, if I can just add a little bit to that is most people don't have the courage to go after their own dreams. So you can't expect them to encourage you to go after yours. We are all experts at talking ourselves out of things. So, you know, you're the only one who knows what's right for you. And you're the only one you need to talk yourself into it. Yep, that's absolutely right. Um, that is absolutely right. And uh, we're going to end on that note. Thank you so much for being part of the works today. We got another great show for you uh, next Sunday. So I hope that you'll tune in. Until then, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Bye. Mm -hmm.